try one, two, three, is okay? It's perfect. Okay. At the end of September 2011, I went on a nine days fact-finding mission to the delta of the Niger River. My knowledge about Nigeria was rather superficial. It was mostly what I had read on Wikipedia and a couple of international reports. The country has over 160 million people of population. They speak 40 local languages and English is one of the official. Muslim to the North Saharan part and Christian to the Delta in the South. Nigeria is often in the international news because of the terrorism on religious basis and the violence caused by militants in the oil production regions. I was the most inexperienced from a group of environmental activists and media people coming from Italy, France, UK and Bulgaria. The group was about to investigate the deeds of some of the biggest names in the oil business. I packed for the equatorial swamps, rubber boots, mosquito nets, repellents, cameras, a certificate for yellow fever vaccination and lots of first aid medication. Not many flights from Sofia to Port Harcourt these days. I had to fly to Paris, then to Lagos and finally to the oil capital of Nigeria. I couldn't help but think of my carbon footprint after such an extensive air travel. It seemed a bit ironic that we were to investigate the petrol operations in Nigeria and causing the use of all that kerosene in the same time. Kerosene that could have been derived from Nigerian oil. Right after landing, I got overwhelmed by the smell. The smell of oil. Whether it was the nasty exhaust from the old aircraft at the airport, the bustling streets full of old cars and noisy diesel generators, or the smell from the oil spills and the primitively flared gas during oil extraction, I didn't realize the smell was to stay with me during the entire nine days of my journey. I teach in some journalistic workshop and with young people I try to let them understand which concept is more useful in journalism. So the game is this, I ask the young people just to cover one eye first and to look around, then to cover the second eye and to look around and they suddenly discover that the colors are different because most of human beings uh, see different colors from each eye. And so I'll ask them, which are the true colors? And nobody can answer. Somebody tries to, uh, tries to answer. The, color, the true colors are the ones that we see with both eyes. And then I ask why? And there is not, no answer, of course, because there are different sides, there are different perceptions, there are different truths. This can be a concept uh, more useful to work as a journalist. So that the lesson to be learned is that there are different points of view and that the truth is not never one, one single truth, but everybody looking for correct information should ask uh, who is giving the information, should I rely, should I trust this source of information and choose wisely, this is the lesson to be learned. EU imports 80% of the oil and 60% of the gas. We are the world's largest energy importer. Around 20% of Nigeria's oil is consumed within the Eurozone. Nigeria is now the largest oil exporter south of Sahara and number 8 worldwide shipping officially some 2 million barrels of oil per day and maybe up to 4 million according to unofficial estimates. 
counter logic, almost all the refined oil consumed within Nigeria itself is imported. The country has very few refineries. Nigeria extracts the crude oil, exports it, the oil gets refined outside the country and then is re-imported as fuel ready to use in transport or in the generators. Oil has generated over 60 billion in income for the Nigerian state since 1960s when oil production started. More than two-thirds of this money have ended up in private pockets, meaning they only fueled the corruption and provided no positive impact on the majority of the local people. So Shell is kind of the only exception that can keep this high walls. The size. Yes, and the rest of the people were forced to, to, down. to bring down, bring their, down fences. their fences. This was our first encounter with a double standard set for the oil companies and for the rest of the people in Nigeria. Everyone in Port Harcourt had to bring down their concrete security fences. Everyone except Shell. More than 10,000 kilometers of pipelines crossed the delta of Niger. Many of these pipelines are 40 years old and corroded, regularly causing massive oil spills. It is estimated that up to 700 barrels are spilled in the delta area every day. This has lasted for decades. Cumulatively, the oil spilled in the delta dwarfs the enormous disaster caused by British petroleum in the Gulf of Mexico. Official statistics announce over 2,000 major oil spill locations in the Delta. Our hosts from ERA claim the spills are over 8,000. The Anglo-Dutch oil multinational Shell has its brand over half of the oil operations in Nigeria. We were taken to visit oil spills that ruined the lives of two communities in Ogoni land. Shell operates two major oil production fields situated northeast and northwest of Goi community. They are called Bomu and Bodu West. Whenever a spill occurs in either of them, the oil ends up in the creek near Goi. The first serious spill dates back to 1988. The case was resolved by the Nigerian court recently with a funny compensation of a few hundred euro. Major spills continued in 1997, 2004 and 2008. The most devastating for Goi took place in 2004, a leak from the Trans Niger pipeline. It caused fires which burned buildings and a large area of forests and mangroves. The life in the river disappeared, trees have died, and the entire local social and economic life has been disrupted. Everyone in the community has been forced to resettle. Families have been split, forced to feel like aliens living in other communities. In an attempt to avoid to pay compensation to the affected communities, Shell initially claimed that the 2004 spill was due to sabotage. It is common for oil companies to claim that spills are caused by saboteurs even though there have been regular oil spills since the 1970s, while violence against oil companies in the Delta is a more recent phenomenon. They cannot say state of insecurity. In the 80s, in the 70s, when there was spillage, where, where there militancy, mm -hmm. there was nothing like militancy. In the early 90s, where there militancy, no. Militancy came about, uh, about uh, six years ago, about five or six years ago. That's when militancy came up. So bunkering, that's... bunkering activities came up within uh, five, six years ago. Right. So you say that kidnappings and all these nasty things have hap started happening in 2005-2006 while oil spills were a regular thing from the 70s from the 70s yes in this early 70s when i was growing up most of us will confirm to you attest to you that there was relative calm the oil companies were going about their business freely nobody challenges them no security persons in their platforms and all that. In fact, we sometimes run away from them when we see them, when we hear their speedboat coming and we are on their pulling on our pad, you know, our canoe. Sometimes we say they, they, they behead people to do sacrifice when they, they are drilling. So the local persons have that belief that they are looking for head, head to cut. So when we hear those, we run. We just tie our canoe and then run into the bush. That has been the case. 
But it is now a reversal. When they see, it is they themselves that will be running now, if not for the fact that they have the military always with them now. Indeed, it's more than obvious that the people in the Delta do not make the guns in their tin roof huts. They get them from outside. Later on, Cho has tried to refer to the 2004 spill as a legacy spill, implying that the spill has occurred from another company's operations, but the only oil field where the spill could have come from is Shell's own Bomo oil field. Local villagers blame the poor state of Shell's oil pipelines and the history of inadequate maintenance for the spills. Mr. Du, local leader and businessman from Goy community, filed a lawsuit against Shell in 2007 in a Dutch court in The Hague, the Netherlands. Because of the spill, he lost his fish farm and a bakery, both of which have been established by his father, who was employing 200 people in the community. Shell has repeatedly tried to argue that the case should be heard in Nigeria rather than the Netherlands, a prospect which could delay the judgment for decades. I'm the one who sued Shell in the Netherlands. Why were you entitled to, to do it personally? Why I do it personally is that, as a then, when we brought in international uh, observers to see the environment, we were advised not to take money from Shell. Uh, all of a sudden, you know, Shell are very smart. They now brought in some little coins and uh, the community became divided. And people who want to take the money took the money. I was not involved. Nobody asked me to have a, a, a fair share of what was going on. So I decided to sue Shell in my own name, so, not the community name, because of my investment. But you say Shell just gave some little money to people who gave up looking for justice yes, then? Because, yes, that's what Shell did, because our people are hungry. Yes. And uh, they cannot see little money, and people who are hungry, if they see something, they must eat. But uh, those who doesn't want to compromise it, ignore it. I personally ignored what they brought. And I instituted the case in the Netherlands. And uh, I believe I will get justice there. I am paying tax to the government, federal government, the public of Nigeria. I have registered my business under the law. And Shell is also registered. And they are paying tax to the federal government under the law. So by virtue of our position, Shell facility is not supposed to destroy my personal facility. My investment is my investment, Shell investment is their own investment. They're supposed to take adequate security and get measures to protect their facility so as to avoid spilling to destroy my investment. From 2040 today, I have nothing to offer. We went to the other community called Bodo. After a short reception by the local chiefs, we were invited to see the disaster ourselves. The crude could be smelled some 200 meters away from the riverbanks, and the smell becomes sickening closer to the waters. The riverbanks and the bottoms of the boats were black of crude that had thickened and solidified. Hundreds of square kilometers of dead mangroves were the only scenery in the area of the spill. We feared mosquito bites in the jungle, but there was no fish in the water, no birds in the sky, and there were no mosquitoes either. Only desperate people trying to maintain their lives in this dead land. We saw children swimming in these waters while United Nations Environmental Programme report of 2010 reports level of cancer-causing substances up to 900 times above the World Health Organization tolerance levels. The quantity of oil that was spilled in 2008-2009 is unknown. Villagers put the figure at 200,000 barrels but Shell repeatedly disputes this. As a comparison, Exxon Valdez tanker disaster in Alaska from 1989 caused over 100,000 barrels to be spilled in just seven minutes. The leak at Bodu went uninterrupted for three months. After the disaster, Shell sent the following relief materials to the local people. Two bags of stockfish, 50 bags of rice, 20 bags of beans, 10 bags of sugar. This humanitarian aid was supposed to cover the needs of 69,000 people. The community accepted it only as an evidence that there is no sabotage. In cases of sabotage, all companies do not provide any relief materials whatsoever. This policy of the old company seems quite unfair, considering that even in cases of sabotage, the majority of local people are not involved. 
but are forced to suffer all the consequences of the damage, the poisoned land, the dead rivers, and being left with no help from the outside. Did anyone in Europe hear about the disaster when it actually happened? I first thought it must be the Bulgarian media that skipped the news. Then, all the people in my group realized they heard nothing about it in their countries either. How come? The next day we traveled to another community and another problem. Gas flaring. When companies extract oil, it comes out mixed with gas. Instead of using it, they burn it right on spot. The gas burns in hundreds of locations around Nigeria, day and night, releasing dangerous toxins and despite being made illegal in the country over 30 years ago. The oil companies and the Nigerian government have promised to end flaring, but the practice continues, polluting the local air and reportedly causing major adverse health impacts. Flaring is also a major contributor to climate change. The volume of gas burned off every year worldwide is equivalent to the combined annual gas consumption of Germany and France, or to twice the annual gas consumption of Africa. We traveled to a community called Egbocha, where the Nigerian subsidiary of Ajip, the petrol brand of the Italian energy giant Eni, has flared gas day and night non-stop since the end of the 70s. On the way we had to often put our cameras down because of the security points situated every few hundred meters. Community representatives complain from the acid rains that make the tin roofs of their houses corrode in a few months. People can't hang out the laundry because it gets covered with black ashes from the flames. Their crops are also failing from the toxins. Many species of animals that were once common cannot be found anymore in the surrounding forests. The fires that we saw near the village were supposed to have been out a year ago, replaced by a modern gas power plant that provides electricity to the local people. But what did we find there? Elena, it's the date of uh, the workshop that we're going to have in Nigeria. Can you tell me what you just found out yes. on the any webpage? I found out, first of all, that what you can find uh, in Italia, you cannot find it in English. And uh, when you look uh, through um, the web, their webpage on Nigeria, there is a section called uh, Access to Energy and Projects to... Uh, for flaring down and basically among uh, the projects uh, they name uh, the Ebocha Early Gas Recovery which is uh, eventually has been realized uh, in Ebocha and uh, it allowed to achieve the objective of seizing uh, the practice of gas flaring on the site uh, thanks to the reuse and compression of associated gas that before was burning torch. And what we found out there on spot? On spot we found out a very, very old plant, extraction plant, with very old pipes, a huge lake of wastewater and toxics from extraction that was just open air on the field in the middle of the community and several gas flares, very, very big ones. So we are really wondering where is this facility and when gas flaring finished in Ebocha. Thank you, Elena. But in 2009, it was nominated by the Dow Jones as the most sustainable company in the world. So I heard it from the, the, the voice of someone working in a big, private investment bank in Italy. He told me, how is it possible that an oil company, never mind which company, but how is it possible that an oil company gets the price as the most sustainable company in the world when the oil business is just not sustainable in itself? Short travel away from Egbocha and we enter a place where the French oil giant Total operates, the land of Egi. Total's website represents the company's collaboration with the Aggie community as a success story, highlighting the signing of a Memorandum of Understanding in 2007 and the adoption of an Aggie community's Integrated Development Master Plan in 2009. 
but quite a different story emerged when we visited the community in River State ourselves. Oil exploitation began in 1964, and Toto started to occupy a significant part of Aggie's land, seriously damaging the environment and compromising village livelihoods. Toto has made an electricity power plant, but it does not supply electricity to the Aggie people. Their land has been compulsory seized by the government, with no compensation provided. And now, an endless concrete wall surrounding the power plant is fragmenting the land of Aggie people. The promised development never came. The expropriation of land without compensation is permitted under the Land Use Act of 1979. The victims of this law since then are countless. In Nigeria, billions of cubic meters of gas are burned and wasted every year just like that. Gas equal to over 15 million cars that work day and night. And what do we do in Europe? We start looking for crazy ways to subsidize gas or to extract unconventional gas, such as fracking for shale gas. The American company Chevron was planning to do fracking for shale gas in my side of Europe, in Bulgaria. They were promising bright future, energy independence from Russia and minimum risk for the environment. Considering their recent record in Latin America and knowing a story from Nigeria from 1998 when the company transported Nigerian troops to extinguish a peaceful protest near one of their operational sites, I just couldn't help but ask here and there for some more stories on Chevron. One guy we met during our travel explained Chevron is the best oil company in Nigeria, taking care of their workers, maintaining labor unions and so on and so on. Wow, a good oil company was my reaction. Then he handed over his business card and I read he was a worker of Chevron. Then I got an arrangement to make an interview with a female rights activist who works with women from communities situated near the Escavos oil terminal of Chevron. Here's the story. Because of the patriarchal practices in the region, women do not interface with Chevron management the way the community leaders, which are mainly men and the youth leaders, are interfacing with them. Maybe some of the people who say that Chevron is doing well are some of those men that benefit from a little bit of contracts from Chevron, but the women are not benefiting in any way because the environment is impacted and because they've been displaced from their livelihood and, be and, and because of the oil politics that is being played around that region, there has always been conflict. Oil spills, when compensation are paid, in those few cases when they are paid, the women don't get anything because, because of tradition, they don't engage with Chevron. It is only the men that get it. Then it is the women that relate more with the environment than the men. And the little fish they still get from that river taste of oil. Chevron used to provide a boat for the women to take them from the community to worry. Then after some time, the boat was withdrawn, and the women demanded that the boat should be returned because withdrawing that boat meant cutting them off from other parts of the state. And when Chevron refused, the women used their paddle canoes and tied them across the canal where the Chevron exchange boats used to come from from Escravos to the Bitege fuel station to pick up the staff. So the women blocked that place and said the Chevron boat will not cross to enter the fuel station. And what did Chevron do? How did they respond? They brought gun boats and then they sunk the canoes of the women. Two women got drowned that day. They sunk the canoes of the women. Two women got drowned. They passed and did their whatever. But do at the end, they were able to restore the boat back to the women. There were promises of microcredit scheme, there were promises of skills acquisition that I have that have not been realized. There were promises to build women development center where women can go to learn skills because uh, their traditional means of livelihood have been dis destroyed. That has not been realized. There were promises of uh, microcredit scheme that started but was disrupted by communal conflict. And after that communal conflict, they did not go back to that program. And there were also promises of uh, giving women small contracts of uh, running the full canteen and all that. That also, 
has not been, and that also has not been realized. On the fourth day of our stay, we headed to Kuala Enokpai, another two communities living near oil fields operated by Ajip. We were welcomed in Kuala by the local chiefs and we heard their story. Ajip had promised development but kept none of the promises. A few years ago, Ajip has signed a memorandum with the local community in Kuala. For example, in the memorandum they promised one kilometer of sewage and made it. And how they made it? One kilometer of open ditch ending in the middle of the street and causing actually bigger problem than before. They promised roads. We saw mud. We also saw one of those elevated water tanks. They are almost in every village in Nigeria and never work. They are supposed to make the life of the people a bit easier. But someone has taken the money to build them and it all ended up there. We went to the oil field by crossing the river on an ancient ferry, famous for its occasional accidents, sometimes ending up with casualties. We approached Okpai community, which is right next to the oil operations. On our left were the huts of poor people. On our right, we were passing by the corroded pipes, transporting the gas from the oil wells to the flaring points. Here, just like in Agbocha, and despite the promises, the gas was still burning day and night. While on the webpage of Eni stood a proud message that burning should have been ended up three months prior to our visit. About the reduction of gas, no? They say that we are using associated gas to produce electricity. So, what was the, the quantity of the, re the reduction that they did? And uh, what was the situation with gas flaring in Guam? And what they declared? They gave some numbers about the reduction of emissions in the atmosphere. And then they said that by, this was in May 2011, they said by June 2011, gas flaring is going to be over in Kuala. So I don't need to say it in front of you because you come from there. Some people here come from there. But gas flaring is still going on on that spot. So you see, this is the company. We are talking about serious violations of human rights. This project was supposed to receive funding through the Clean Development Mechanism under the Kyoto Treaty. I truly hope they don't get any money for these lies. Failing to verify that flaring is not over has no excuse. The people who have to check don't even have to do all the travel. After all, the flames can be seen from space. The shocking discoveries were far from over. In Okpai, people complained that for the construction of the power plant by Ajip, a lot of sand was excavated from the river bank. This caused terrible erosion and the marketplace of the village, together with about 50 houses, have been swallowed by the river. We were listening that story with dismay. An old man must have seen our faces and he brought us a picture of his destroyed house showing there were buildings right next to where we stood and where the river was now floating. A deserted medical center was also reminding the time before the erosion started. The power plant itself was not visible on public satellite images on the internet. Like, it is not a private ownership, but a very important military secret. Next to the power plant again, we saw houses of extremely poor people with no electricity at home. These huts were next to the military checkpoint and the fence of the power plant. Our Italian colleagues have requested in advance to visit the plant, but nobody from the group was allowed to enter. We were escorted out of the island by a military patrol car. At a great risk, we turned where the gas flaring points are to take footage of the flares. No one followed us, but our hosts in the car were in panic. Then we left the island on the same old ferry. The Italian photographer and I were angry because we both missed the chance to make some important shots. We both wanted to make some night shots of the gas flaring and when we were denied we got even angrier. It was only the next day that we learned that there have been threats for our lives. The coordinator of the mission in Port Harcourt didn't sleep all night long and eight heavily armed guys have been watching for our security till the morning. Two of them even stood on the rooftop of the hotel in the heavy equatorial rain that poured that night. 
Two people from the community leaders have been threatened with death if they are seen out of town. This is the Chevron Cave gas flame activities in Olomoro Ole. They clearly said that the bushes are lush green. Say these bushes are lush green. My name is uh, George Ogara. Uh, I'm uh, the project coordinator of Law Edge Advocacy Department. Uh, the sole purpose of the organization is to use law to protect our environment. This case, Orini Mihat, Maso uh, said, the Nigerian Liquefied Natural Gas Limited. One of their defense is that uh, the community representatives, they don't have the requisite local standard, that's what he's saying. If you do not have the local standard, you cannot come to court. You can't maintain this action in court. In another case which we filed for LLA Alimini Community in Emoha local government area of River State, complaining about the gas blaring activity of uh, Tutafina Elf, in that community, the company came to court, uh, hired a senior advocate of Nigeria, and this is to tell you in all the cases who are filed, the companies have, have always had to hire senior advocates of Nigeria to confront, uh, confront us in court. And this senior advocate uh, filed their defense of, the defense of uh, Total Final L and uh, stated that uh, the, we the community has been cut up by the local limitation law. In other words, they do not have to go, they can't go to court because they have slept on their right for so long. That they have been here since 1960 and there is nobody disturbing them. Their right to claim has expired, even though they are still flaring. Then secondly, they're saying that gas flaring cannot be determined by the courts. And I ask myself, why? It's a court has no power to look into this kind of claim. The right which they are claiming, which is right to life, cannot be enforced by going to court in an action. What does this mean? That you can't enforce it while you are alive. You have to die first. Before we left Nigeria, we decided to change the plan once again and to visit one more place. In a community called Calabao Cordia, we heard there was a spill from pipeline operated by Ajip. The spill was running uninterrupted for two weeks. Indeed, we were brought by the locals to a fountain of some muddy greenish petrol derivate with sickening smell. It was not crude oil, but something semi-refined. We went through the village to reach another two spill points, going on and on like this one. The community seemed nice and tidy. We entered the jungle and the cassava fields and reached another leaking part of the pipe. Then we were brought to another field. It was black of crude from a previous leak that had happened a few weeks ago and that also went uninterrupted for more than two weeks. The pollution was left with no cleanup, killing the crops of these poor people who have no other way of living but growing cassava and fishing in the creeks. In this environment of induced conflict and violence, and thanks to the high prices of oil that we all complain from but we keep paying, the oil companies have a plan B, to move offshore. It is expected that in a few years Exxon will outperform Shell as the major oil producer in the Gulf of Guinea, by establishing more and more operations offshore the Nigerian coast. The advantages to the oil companies that go offshore, less attacks from militancy group, and even more difficulties for the Nigerian authorities to track the actual amounts of oil extracted. The risk for the environment is even bigger offshore, considering all the major oil rig catastrophes from the last few years, like the British Petroleum oil disaster in the Gulf of Mexico, and very recently, at the end of 2011, a major explosion on an oil rig just off the coast of Nigeria. I was wondering how do I have to cover one eye or the other to see the colors of the situation like the oil companies do. I did see tremendous pollution and devastation. I did see poor people who deserve to be treated with dignity, but there is no one to hear them and to resolve the problems that they have to suffer caused by others. I'm sure that the oil companies have their sugar-coated explanation of everything. And if they don't have an explanation right away, they can still hide behind their army of lawyers 
who are ready to twist the laws of physics and, if necessary, to prove that the Earth is flat. This is because the oil companies are involved in divide and rule tactics in the communities. They look for a few vocal voices in the community, give them juicy contracts or give them scholarship so that those ones will continue to be their mouthpiece in the community. Ask the executive director of Chevron a question. As a when will Chevron end gas flaring in the Niger Delta? And he said because of all the disruptions of the activities in the Niger Delta, that it is difficult for them to tell when they will end gas flaring in the Niger Delta. Which to me and to every other person means that there is no plan to face up gas flaring. And we all know the impact of gas flaring on the general population of the people, and specifically on women, because it has effects on the reproductive system of women. It has it impacts on fertility, it impacts on childbirth, it causes cancer, it causes skin diseases and respiratory uh, infections. And they don't they, they, they don't take the community people as if they are human beings. Why this situation? It's because people became so enlightened, people like Ken Saruwiwa, to ask questions that why must the environment continuously uh, suffer degradation, pollution, and then nobody talks. So when people begin to ask questions, that was when this conflict came up in the oil industry. During the takeoff of the airplane back to Paris, I opened the onboard magazine. There was an article saying that the world has lost over one third of the mangrove forests over the last 20 years or so. Tell me, I just saw the devastation with my own eyes. I took my camera and ran to the window of the aircraft, and there it was. The only light on the ground was a solitary giant gas flare a few kilometers below us. No other lights. I was glad I finally made my night footage. Then I realized there is nothing to be glad about at that site. In the morning the screen in front welcomed me, with the view of the cities below, emerged in street lights, tidy and shiny. These were the cities of Europe, as an outrageous contrast to the lightless villages of Nigeria and the lonely gas flare. Europe was debating on its energy security, at what price and at whose expense. It was a beautiful sunrise at Charles de Gaulle airport in Paris. I was waiting for my connecting flight and it was time for Europe to wake up. <laughs> 